Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for being back to the new to new event of the Ipatia Colloquium Series 2022. I would like to, as usual, to congratulate with our speakers of today and all the speakers of the series, which is an ISO series dedicated to early career scientists, uh, which were selected. There was a call in November last year, and they were selected through a very competitive uh, selection process. So congratulations to all the speakers. Uh, we. Uh, we just a very technical, just a technical aspect. Please uh, be reminded that uh, the event is live streamed on YouTube. So if people on the Zoom uh, attended the event through Zoom, if you are uncomfortable with that, please leave the, the you can leave the, 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 the event and you can still uh, follow the event live on YouTube, where you can also in, in, uh, basically send questions to the speakers using the live chat. Uh, also speakers in the in the in Zoom, then you can make the question by raising your hand and make a question yourself when the chair gives you the floor. Uh, and please, if you feel comfortable with that, turn on your camera so and introduce yourself to the speakers. Um, having said that, uh, and if you want, just the last, last point, if you want, you can also send questions anonymously by using, there is a form online that is available on the Ipatia Colloquium series pages. You go, there is, a, the, there is a form, and then you use the form to send the question, so you can choose to be anonymous, and this way you, the, your name won't be spelled uh, during the talk, to the, the event. These are, please, these are the two speakers of today, Kasper Heinz and um, Tirna Deb. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, both of them, uh, of course. Uh, and today, Tuktu, uh, she's an ISO student. She's helping us and she's helping me actually in, in co chairing the event. So, thank you very much to Tuktu. And with this, I can just close now the sharing. I can stop to share. And now I'd like to immediately welcome uh, and introduce Kasper Heinz. Uh, to our uh, event. Thank you. Welcome, Heinz. Uh, welcome, Casper. Uh, Casper got the PhD in 2019. He's an expert of AGN and, and, and the Galaxy, uh, Gamma Ray Burst and, and Quasars. And uh, now is uh, is uh, let me read it because I don't want to make a mistake. Is a is a postdoc um, at the still at university, so University of Iceland, and is a. a a um, Radnis postdoctoral fellow, right, which is an independent individual grant. So congratulations and uh, for your career. Congrats, and thank you very much for being with us today. And please, uh, you can go ahead now with your talk. Um, as I said, you have uh, 20 to 25 minutes of time, and then you, we will have time for questions from the speakers um, of today. So thank you very much. Uh, the floor is yours. Now. Perfect. Thank you very much for this uh, kind, uh, nice introduction. Um, so yeah, just a small, uh, I guess, uh, personal update that of uh, or from February 1st, I was uh, appointed uh, an assistant professor here at the Cosmic Dawn Center at the University of Copenhagen. Ah, um, congratulations. Sorry, I didn't, uh, that's my mistake. Congratulations. That's, uh, yeah, well, that's done. well done. <laughs> well done. Right. Thank you. Yep, Maybe so, the idea uh, was uh, what contributed. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. And thanks again for the opportunities to speak at this uh, colloquium. So uh, the topic of uh, my talk today is uh, is uh, presenting some of the work I've been doing in the last few years uh, on how we can measure the neutral atomic hydrogen gas mass of the most distant, uh, distant galaxies. Um, and I'll just start by showing this, uh, this schematic of the, of the history of the universe where um, I've highlighted that, you know, following the epoch of recombination, the universe is in a mostly, um, at least the baryonic material is in mostly in a neutral atomic gaseous phase, that then at some point start to uh, accrete into these first uh, proto uh, galaxies, they will then eventually cool and uh, condense into molecular gas and then uh, eventually start producing stars um, heralding this epoch of reionization that uh, we have here and then um, I guess we most of you know the rest that uh, we start to get these larger and larger structures of, uh, of galaxies. Um, so this uh, this um, scenario or um, state was uh, um, very recently demonstrated or quantified by Fabian Walder in his paper from 2020 uh, and collaborators, of course. Um, 
where I showed this uh, figure here, where you can see in the top left that uh, shows the stellar mass, or the, no, sorry, the star formation rate density uh, as a function of redshift from uh, the present day out to redshift uh, four. And on the top right in red shows the stellar mass uh, build up. And then in the top, um, oh no, sorry, in the bottom left is the H1, uh, the cosmic, cosmic H1 gas mass density as a function of redshift. And then here in the bottom right is the uh, H2 gas mass density, showing how it evolves. Um, so comparing these uh, curves from the current best available data, we can start to say something about how the um, this baryonic matter in galaxies, how this evolves as a function of time, and also make, um, as they do in the paper, make some predictions for how it evolves in the future and, and what it looked like uh, here at redshift 4 and even beyond in the very early universe. So we know from these um, predictions that the most of the of the baryonic matter in galaxies should be in the form of neutral atomic hydrogen H1, uh, as shown by this red curve here. Oh, sorry, by this green curve here, um, which uh, constitute up to seventy percent of the baryonic matter in galaxies at this uh, at this epoch, based on the on this available data. But this is with the very key uh, caveat that in most of these other, so for the blue and the, and the red line, we measure the stellar mass buildup and the, and the molecular gas mass density. We measure it directly from, uh, from last surveys, uh, uh, surveying, for example, the CO transition to get the molecular gas and, and these optical and near-infrared surveys to get a sense of the, um, of the UV and, and infrared um, light components, or stellar components in these galaxies. But for the for the H1, we don't have a, a similar good tracer of, uh, of the neutral gas to um, to be able to directly in individual galaxies, a high redshift, to go and measure this, um, this component. Um, so in the local universe, uh, and, and when I say local universe, I mean up to a redshift of about 0.4, you can detect H1 in galaxies based on the 21 uh, hyperfin transition, um, which is the spin flip of neutral hydrogen, you can measure that directly and thereby trace the, uh, the neutral hydrogen in, uh, in galaxies in this fairly um, local and this fairly local scales. And there have also been uh, some recent works that show that you can also, or we can now with uh, current facil facilities detect um, the, the total integrated signal from uh, thousands of galaxies up to about redshift of one um, of this 21 centimeter line, giving us like an average estimate of the, uh, of the amount of neutral hydrogen in galaxies um, at this redshift. But if we go back to this um, illustration again, this means that we can only really detect and measure um, the, uh, the amount of neutral gas in the galaxies in this very uh, late phase of the universe. Uh, and we're of course very interested in, in covering you know, most of the, of the cosmic history as we can now do with uh, most of these uh, optical to near infrared uh, galaxy surveys and also CO and other traces of the molecular gas. So we of course want to, to uh, measure or probe uh, galaxies, or the neutral gas in galaxies on a similar time scale um, than what is possible currently with the 21 centimeter line. So previously the uh, way people have, um, have inferred the, the amount of neutral hydrogen in galaxies beyond redshift of one or two, uh, is via so-called band Lyman alpha absorbers. So uh, this is where you have a quasar, a bright background quasar that then uh, intersects some foreground galaxy uh, in the line of sight to, uh, to us here on Earth. Uh, and then the uh, amount of gas, the neutral hydrogen gas, will be imprinted as this broad band Lyman alpha absorption feature, uh, along with some metal lines from the, um, from the foreground galaxy as well. Uh, which allows you to somewhat indirectly infer the amount of, uh, of hydrogen, at least in the, this column through the galaxy. The main uh, disadvantage of this approach is that we often don't really know at which point this quasar sideline um, intersects the foreground galaxy. Uh, and we don't really know like, so what, what the global uh, content of, of the galaxy is. We only get this, uh, line of, this very narrow pencil beam line of sight through the galaxy. Uh, yeah. So what we can do instead is that um, we can uh, alleviate one of the problems here in that we can uh, study gamma ray bursts, for example, which is a uh, very massive um, or even more massive stars than give rise to, uh, to ordinary type two supernovae. They're typically found to explode within 
like deep within the central parts of, uh, of the host galaxies, and thereby gives us a measure of the, uh, of the ISM from, from the sideline uh, from the center of the galaxy, galaxy throughout the ISM. Um, and then also similar, we see H1, uh, the Lyman alpha transition in most cases, these high redshift gamma ray bursts. And then the point is that we want to find some tracer uh, that connects to uh, H1. Since again, we, we can't really make any conclusions about the total, total H1 uh, content in this galaxy only in the line of sight. But what we can do is that we can measure very accurately the amount of H1 in the, in the sight line and then also some other gas tracer, um, which we can then um, compare. So we get a, a very accurate ratio of the two lines. And here we've chosen single, singly ionized um, carbon and specifically this fine structure transition. So before going forward, I'd just like to, uh, to motivate the use of, um, of a singly ionized carbon to trace H1 and not uh, H2, as has also previous, previously been done. Um, and the first reason is that it's, uh, it's very bright. So it means that you can detect C2 uh, from galaxies out to uh, most of the observable universe. There are some references that uh, detect C2 even beyond redshift of, uh, of seven. Then there are some observations and also simulations that suggest that the C2 predominantly originates from this neutral atomic gas phase. Um, as you can see in this picture by Kruxel et al. here. Um, and this makes sense because we know that the, that the ionization potential of a neutral carbon is below that of, a, of a neutral hydrogen, which means that most of the carbon in the neutral gas phase of the ISM will be in singly ionized, uh, or will be in a singly ionized state purely because of this lower ionization potential. So you expect a large um, fraction of C2, or a large fraction of carbon to be in the form of C2 throughout the neutral ISM. Um, so this is also what we observe in, the, in both local galaxies and in the high redshift, um, where we typically find that the C2 uh, emission maps are much more extended than the UV components or the dust or the CO components, as shown uh, by these figures here. Um, by some of the recent papers surveying the C2 emission of uh, these redshift six galaxies. Um, so if you compare the, the right figure here of the extended C2 emission with this figure here from uh, Madden et al. Uh, of a redshift zero galaxy, then you can see that it's somewhat uh, similar. It's a somewhat similar um, uh, it's called maps or uh, emission that we see in that the C2 is much more extended than these CO or uh, molecular nuts in the galaxy. Um, and also the C2 emission is much, or is found to be much more coincident uh, with the H1 emission that you can also directly measure um, in the local university or in the local galaxies here. Uh, so in, having now hopefully convinced you that the C2 is a good uh, trace, a good proxy for the neutral gas, then what we did is that we took a sample uh, of gamma ray bursts observed with the x spectrograph at the VLT. Um, and then we uh, measured the amount of H1, the column density of H1 in all these cases. And similarly, we also measured the column density of this fine structure C2 transition, which is the exact transition that gives rise to the uh, 185 micrometer um, C2 transition that we observe in emission from these distant galaxies. So by measuring the abundances of this state, uh, we can very accurately predict the uh, luminosity related to this column density. So, um, so what we're after, is uh, this C2 to H1 gas mass conversion factor uh, written like this. So we found what we called it beta C2 um, in, uh, in close um, association, I guess, with the alpha C2 or alpha CO, um, but where we are instead interested in the H1 gas mass and not the H2. Um, but so what we do is that we, um, we measure the C2 condensate and the H1 condensate here. Uh, and then we just uh, calculate what is the expected a column luminosity based on the spontaneous decay uh, of the amount uh, of the population in this uh, transition here, based on just some uh, constants. And there's also just a constant here, um, which allows us to make this, uh, uh, this formulation or this prediction for the uh, column conversion factor of um, C2 to H1, which if we assume that the gamma ray burst they measure the the, the sideline from this from the central part of the galaxy throughout the ISM, if that sideline is representative of like global average of the two, and then we can equate the uh, the ratios of the two condensates that we observe 
to the total C2 to a H1 conversion. Um, and so just to show you the, the results that we got from the, from the gamma ray burst sample, so these are shown in the, as the red points here, is that we find a, a, a dependence of this beta C2, so the C2 to H1 conversion, uh, depending on the metallicity. Um, so this makes sense as you just have, you know, mostly a linear slope, uh, meaning that uh, you just have, you know, more carbon as you increase the metallicity, which makes sense. And then we also compare to some recent simulations. So there are these uh, square symbols here that seem to show a, a similar metallicity evolution. And then there's also um, a redshift zero sample of uh, dwarf galaxies from the, from Comir in uh, 2015 that also seems to nicely follow a similar metallicity evolution. So that means that we now have a very good um, and very accurate measure of the, uh, the amount of C2 per H1 um, gas galaxies. So what we need to do, or oh no, so what I first need to illustrate is just that as a, with the higher metallicity, we then get more metals and more C2. Yeah. But with this uh, accurate conversion is that, um, is that we can now go out and apply. So uh, there have been many recent samples of, uh, of C2 uh, emission or uh, galaxy surveyed for C2 emission um, that we can then go out and apply this conversion factor to. Um, so here I show in, in green, Assemble at redshift around two from Senela et al. And then there are also this uh, recent Elma Alpine survey and also this um, work from KPAC et al. In, in 2015, where we can then go out and apply our calibration uh, based on the total integrated C2 measure to get the global H1 gas mass content. Uh, and what we find is that this, um, so relating the H1 gas mass in these individual galaxies to the stellar mass, we find that this Incre increases gradually as a function of redshift, as we also commonly obs uh, observe for the um, H2 gas mass fraction to stellar mass. So we find this um, overall increase, which is always um, above. So we always predict a larger H1 gas mass than the H2 gas mass uh, at all redshifts. And this is also illustrated in this schematic here, where we, we estimate the uh, the H1 gas mass compared to the total baryonic mass, so the H1, the H2, and the stellar mass, uh, where we find that on average it's around maybe tw uh, 20 to 30 percent in the local universe, which then increases up to 50 or 60, even 60 percent uh, these high redshift. Um, so we can conclusively say that the uh, that the galaxies at, at these high redshift are dominated by the neutral atomic hydrogen gas by mass. Um, yeah, so going here, so we can also compare the uh, this H1 gas to stellar mass ratio again, but then here with the metallicity as a function of the galaxy. So here we've just used some very um, uh, basic predictions of the metallicities of these high redshift galaxies based on the on the stellar mass and the star formation rates of so the fundamental plane relation and applied those. But we can see that this relation follows nicely what we expect from, um, from the local redshift zero relation of the H1 gas to stellar mass ratio. And then we also looked at the um, at the dynamical mass. So we have some information about the total dynamical mass of the galaxy based on the width of the C2 line. And we can see that in all cases of these high redshift, then the H1 uh, gas mass is consistent with these estimates, which uh, first of all, um, somewhat confirms the approach in that uh, we don't get completely, uh, you know, either very low or very high predictions for the H1 gas mass. But then it also suggests that the, that indeed these galaxies are dominated by the neutral uh, atomic hydrogen gas. So we see a, a slightly less um, H1 in the this redshift two sample, which we um, believe is just a, a function, or um, is just a, an implication of the larger stellar and molecular gas contributions in these lower redshift galaxies. Then we also look at the uh, at the H1 depletion time scale, which um, Gives you so typically you have the molecular gas that connects to the to the star formation, but this um, H1 depletion is is a more fundamental scheme, um, scale in in the amount of gas that is totally available in the galaxy that can then um, turn into first molecular gas and then into stars, um, and we find that for these high redshift galaxies due to the intense star formation rates, uh, they have fairly low depletion times of only like 0.2 to 2 giga years. Which means that even if they form, you know, like to redshift uh, six, they'll run out of, of even the, the total amount of hydrogen gas 
uh, before they reach to, uh, to around cosmic noon of uh, at redshift two. Um, so they need significant gas inflow to be able to sustain this uh, high uh, star formation activity at these redshifts. Then finally, we can also make some predictions for the, the global um, average or the volume, average uh, H1 gas mass density in galaxies, where we use recent results of the C2 luminosity function um, to, uh, to compute the luminosity density at these uh, redshifts, at the three sample redshifts we looked at. Uh, and then using our conversion, we get an estimate of the total um, H1 gas mass density at this ratio. And you can see it follows nicely what uh, we observed with some local galaxy samples and also with these high redshift uh, DLA samples. So this means that uh, this, this approach at least um, appears to be able to reproduce our current best available data, uh, but then allows us to, uh, to predict or infer the H1 gas mass density of individual galaxies beyond what has currently uh, been possible. All right, so uh, just to give you a brief summary. So with these uh, gamma ray bursts after close, we can very accurately measure the, uh, the C2 to H1 uh, ratio uh, in the central star forming interstellar medium of galaxies from a, a large range of redshifts. Uh, so we can't say anything from the Lyman alpha um, H1 line alone, because we don't know, know much about the geometry of the galaxy, but we can very accurately measure the ratio between the two, which is what we use here. So um, we go out and apply this ratio to recent surveys um, for C2 in, in distant galaxies to infer the, the H1 gas mass content. And we find that the redshift above two or three years, uh, H1 dominates completely the baryonic matter content of, uh, of galaxies. Um, and then I'd just like to mention some, uh, some future um, work we are currently working on and, and hope to also in the even more distant future to uh, be able to work on. So we currently have a, a student, David Viskan, who is working on, uh, on simulations of galaxies uh, from the Simba simulation at uh, Redshift 6 and trying to, to look into this um, beta C2 relation that we find. And if you look on the right here, you can see that uh, his simulations nicely follow our predicted uh, metallicity evolution of the um, yeah, of this conversion factor here and the metallicity uh, on the x-axis. And he also finds a very tight connection between the C2 to uh, H1 galaxy. So and he even finds a tighter, or he finds an even tighter connection between C2 and H1 compared to a C2 and H2, um, potentially indicating that C2 is in fact a, a better tracer of the neutral gas compared to the molecular gas. Um, then we also plan to, uh, to follow up some of these galaxies. So, so the gamma ray bursts uh, and the C2 that we measure in absorption in, uh, in these cases, we plan to follow them up in a mission to, have a, to better study like exactly where these gamma ray bursts occur and, um, and you know, the physical properties of the gas uh, close to the, to the gamma burst and the overall properties of the, of the galaxies um, to better characterize both C2 and, and these galaxies um, overall. And then we also hope, of course, on a bit longer time scale, that with the advent of the SKA, that we can go out to uh, to at least somewhat higher redshift and, and measure the um, the H1 gas content with the 21 centimeter line to compare to our predictions with the C2 uh, gas tracer. And uh, this is all for me. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Perfect in time. Absolutely. Thank you, Casper. So congratulations. Um, thank you very much. I would like to now ask the, our, uh, basically our attendees if they, there are questions either from the chat uh, on YouTube, there is some delay with, you know, on YouTube with respect to the talk or someone in the, in the Zoom meeting. In the meantime, if there are no hands raised, I don't see any, so I can make a question myself. Casper, uh, I'm not I had to apologize because I mean, it's not my field, but this, I was intrigued by this uh, calibration, which, I mean, which, which looks critical, right? In this, in this all, in this, uh, and I was, I, I must admit, I didn't, can you, uh, I didn't understand exactly the, the assumption, the underlying assumption that you are making when you, when you do the, the in, in calibrating, basically, in, the, in making this calibration, exactly where, here, when you describe the con density, I didn't, you, if you can explain it, sorry, 
Yeah. Oh no, don't worry. Yeah. Yes. So, so the whole point is that that you can. Um, so we don't really know anything about like the global C two emission or the global H one content, but we measure very accurately. So from from the central, you know, point of uh, where the GRB explodes throughout the ISM, we yeah. measure very actually the the ratio between the two. So that means that if we trust this ratio and that this ratio, and then we assume that this ratio represents like the global average ratio of C two to H one. Then that means we can go out and then you know measure the global or the total integrated C2 emission from other galaxy, other galaxy samples, to then get the global H1 content. In. But this is regard because I was okay, I understand, but but this is uh, how do you think maybe I'm missing, but how do you think into account the different spatial distribution of the two uh, gas content? I mean the, the two molecular, so the T, the C2 and H1 they have a different spatial uh, location, right? Spatial distribution. So even though the density is the same, the, uh, so how do you, you know? Yes, I mean, so so that's uh, I guess part both the the curse and the, uh, you know, at, in that we we don't really know uh, at all like the distribution. So so what we can say is that we we can say that the C two absorption line shows you know consistent um, like velocity structure and velocity profiles as the other elements that we know trace this neutral ISM, um, which you know is also where most of the um, of where the H1 uh, gas will be located. But I mean, it's also not crucial for us in the sense that if there is any significant C2 or H1 gas along the line of sight, then we will pick that up. So it doesn't really matter too much of where it specifically is located. We just get a measure of the total amount of C2 to H1 yeah. throughout the galaxy okay. uh, without any yeah, resolved uh, information. Okay, 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 I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sorry. And yeah. Uh, if, if there are any questions from from uh, yes, uh, Kevin uh, Harrington, if you you can make the question yourself, please. Sure, thank you. Yeah, Casper, congrats first of all on the professorship. Oh, thank uh, you. For, yeah, so really great work. I'm just wondering if you could comment a little bit further, exactly on this slide, uh, because I, I know that. Of course, C plus can come from ionized and neutral. So here you're assuming it's completely neutral. But I think that that's kind of in line with what's been shown in the literature for the most part. Is, is that true? Or can you comment on this a little bit? Um, yeah, so so I guess, I guess the, the first point is that we don't really assume anything. We just measure the amount of neutral hydrogen and C2 right in the line of sight. So we don't really know like if there is any you know, potential part of the C2 that's located in the... Um, you know, in, in the photo dissociation regions or molecular regions or whatever it is. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be the case that, you know, that at least the velocity profiles are consistent with, you know, when we have H2, for example, it doesn't seem like a lot of the C2 will be located in these regions. Um, so, so it's not really an assumption we make, but it is true that there will be some, um, you know, it will be distributed in, or it will also have some contribution from the molecular phase and so on. Uh, but there are, you know, plenty of, of observations and simulations that suggest that this is not the case. Um, and also, like we see, I mean, so we've observed this for 30 years in, in local galaxies, right? These like very much extended C2 um, emission coinciding with the with the H1 uh, gas as well. Um, and the advantage that you have is getting the absorption line, of course. So that's, yes. yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really interesting angle. To, to predict the 150, 150, 158 micron emission, so. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, that's also like the, the, uh, the uh, what really started it is that, that, you know, measuring H1 in emission is of course, it has been very difficult for a long time. Um, will be partly alleviated with the SKA, but you know, we observe H1 all the time with the quasars and gamma ray bursts and so on. Just had to find a way to, to get this information out or to apply it to, um, to like these global samples. Um, and I also just want to show just, uh, uh, yeah, just an additional plot. So we also did a very similar analysis measuring the C1 to H2. So the C1 to H2 uh, molecular gas conversion in this, in similar sidelines. And this linear relation that we find is completely consistent with, you know, simulations of the alpha C1 and also this local um, estimate at uh, zero metallicity and so on. So, yeah. so it seems like this, you know, the, the relative approximation, I guess, um, what you call it, seems to work out like both in the, for these neutral gas traces and also for the molecular gas traces. And uh, in terms of the dynamical mass that you mentioned, that you measured, there's a bit of a spread still. So I'm wondering, 
you know, how, how this compares to, so the assumption of dynamical mass, you, you have a dynamical equilibrium that you can compute a mass for, but you also argued for the, ne the necessity to have the gas infall at all times because of the H1 depletion time yes. uh, res results. So they kind of contradict in a sense, because nothing's going to be relaxed in that case if everything's, if there's constant infall. So does yes. that help to explain this scatter here? Uh, I mean, so yes, that will, I mean, yeah, yes, that would definitely help to explain, uh, I'm guessing, I mean, so, so obviously there are like a good, you know, deal of, uh, of uncertainty in, in the H1 gas mass uh, estimates, but also, yeah, the dynamical, dynamical mass, exactly for the reasons you say. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I guess the, so many of these, or some good fraction of the C2 lines show, you know, a, a fairly smooth uh, Gaussian profile. So at least, you know, or you could imagine that like the central gas that we measure, uh, the central, you know, star forming uh, cooler gas that we measure in these cases uh, has, you know, relaxed at least a bit more. And then like this, you know, the accreting gases on larger scales, uh, I would imagine without the... Uh, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But, uh, Excellent. Yeah, thank you again. Yeah, no, thank you. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Kasper, we have a, a very quick, if you can answer, we have one question from YouTube, from the YouTube right. chat that I will pass to you. So, hi, Kasper, great talk. Uh, Michele Ginolfi. Uh, hi, Kasper, uh, great talk and exciting results. C2 is predicted and observed to be also a tracer of mo molecular gas in certain ISM conditions. Would it be possible to use your beta C2 factor to constrain the molecular gas fraction once one has an estimate of the total gas with, for example, kinematics? Uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, so that's also, uh, I didn't even get to mention, so that's also something we are we are actively working on now with the, with the like resolved uh, data of C2 and where we also have CO and, and so on to see if, if we can actually, uh, you know, disentangle the two gas um, components or contributions um, from these two phases to see if, uh, um, you know, if we can actually make uh, uh, or find consistent results with the, what we're observing here. Um, and I should also just note for this for this plot I showed here with the total of the H1 gas over the total binary mass, mass is that we actually used the this alpha C2 to, uh, to molecular gas mass ratio as well, just to get some um, yeah predictions. So it's not to say also that that you it can't be used to trace H2 as well. Um, it's just that I believe there is like the the tracer of neutral gas is more physically motivated in these cases. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if that answers the questions. But. Yeah, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm sure. Anyway, the, the the question is on the chat. If you want to have a look at it, then you can also reply directly on the chat on YouTube if you feel comfortable with that. So, but thank you very much, Casper. Congratulations, you. also for, uh, from my side, also to your new position and your very well done. Congratulations, and thank I will you. now leave the floor to to, to, to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, gentlemen. If you can share the my title page again for Turner. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Let me give it and give me one second. Yeah, I can take this to congratulate both of our speakers for having a place at High Fitia College. Yeah, it's we are very happy to have you here. And also thank you, Casper, for the very interesting talk. So you, you want me to share this screen again, right? Yes. Yeah, oh, everyone can see but I wasn't prepared for that, so sorry about oh, that. Sorry. <laughs> I'm doing it now, right? Let me show you. Yes. Just so everyone can read, yeah. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to uh, welcome Turner Depp uh, from Capitan Astronomical Institute from the University of Granada. And we are very excited to hear about her presentation on atomic hydrogen disks as tracer of gravity transformation in April 2016 and beyond. So, whenever you're ready, Turner. I will give you a one minute warning before the time. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction to Tru. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Hello everyone. Um, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. I am Tirna Dev. I am just about to submit my PhD thesis at Captain Astronomical Institute in the Netherlands. I'm about to start a postdoctoral fellowship in UWC at uh, South Africa. And uh, 
I have worked uh, with my uh, PhD supervisors, Mark Verayan, Bianca Poichanti, Thais van der Hulst, and another PhD student, Julia Healy, uh, for this work. And I also collaborate with the GASP collaboration, who are uh, based in Padova in Italy. And today I'll talk about a part of my PhD thesis work. Uh, so I, I am working on a different aspect of agent observations than Casper. I am uh, looking at more of the galaxies in the local universe. And today I'll talk about the atomic hydrogen disks as uh, tracers of galaxy transformations in Able 2626 and beyond. So at first I will uh, give a brief introduction on the role of gas in particular neutral hydrogen gas in galaxy transformations in different environments. And then I'll talk about the meerkat observations of the galaxy cluster Able 2626. And then I'll talk about the H1 morphologies of the galaxies in and around Able 2626 cluster. And then I'll talk about the jellyfish galaxies uh, in that cluster uh, after defining what jellyfish galaxies are. And last but not the least, I'll talk about my future plans on follow-up research. So to start with, in the hierarchical structure formation framework, the galaxy clusters grow by the acquisition of galaxies, galaxy groups, and other clusters through the filaments of cosmic growth. And the migration into the dense environments affects the morphologies of those galaxies and the gas content, in particular neutral hydrogen content in them. And the H1 disks are really sensitive pressures of such environmental mechanisms because they are cold, they are collisional, and they reach far out to the dark matter halo, where gravitational potential is not strong enough. So that's how uh, H1 disks are really sensitive pressures of environmental mechanisms. From the past studies, we have seen that more of the early type of the H1 deficient galaxies are towards the cluster core, and more of the H1 reach or the late type galaxies are in the outskirts of the clusters. So there must be some kind of hydrodynamic or gravitational mechanisms happening close to the cluster core that is depleting the H1 gas from these galaxies and quenching the star formation in them. So on the right, we see uh, in blue the H1 disks in the Virgo galaxy cluster. And uh, in orange, we are seeing hot extra emitting ICM. So what we can see here is close to the center of uh, Virgo, the H1 disks are smaller or absent. And in the bottom right uh, left, we are seeing uh, H1 morphologies of some H1 peculiar galaxies from H1 Rogue's gallery. We see the example of uh, uh, interaction, post module remnant, or some free floating H1 clouds that actually signify some kind of environmental mechanism that might have happened in the distant past. And uh, what we have seen in Vargo is also seen in the work done by Solanus et al where they have looked at uh, different galaxies in uh, H nearby clusters, and they have looked at the fraction of H1 deficient galaxies as a function of projected distance from the cluster center. And uh, they have seen that there are more H1 def deficient galaxies close to the cluster core. So there are several uh, removal and acquisition mechanisms identified so far that happens uh, in the cluster environment. One of them is lamp pressure stripping, here we are seeing an extended H1 tail uh, in co 204 galaxy from my recently published paper. And we are, here we are seeing the famous example of tidal interaction in M81 group. Here we are seeing uh, what we think is thermal evaporation. The coal gas is being evaporated by the hot halo. And here we are seeing a famous example of uh, uh, H1 accretion in the outer disk of NGC 3359. And now I'd like to focus on one particular mechanism that is more, most prominent in clusters called ramp pressure stripping. And the extreme examples of ramp pressure stripping, which are called jellyfish galaxies. Ramp pressure stripping happens when a galaxy falls to the center of the cluster and experiences a hydrodynamic pressure called ramp pressure. If ramp pressure is stronger than the gravitational potential of the galaxy, then the star forming H1 gas can be stripped out of uh, the galaxy and uh, that can display tentacles of materials that stretch tens of kiloparsecs. And often in these tentacles, there are new star formations happening. Uh, from the past studies, there are only few H1 observations of uh, jellyfish galaxies. And H1 observations of the jellyfish galaxies are very important to understand the complex physical mechanism that are happening, especially in the tails of these uh, jellyfish galaxies. So the take home for, from this section is, I think I could convince you that H1 disks are really powerful diagnostic tools for 
environmental processes. Then I'd like to talk about near-care observation of ABLE 2626 galaxy cluster. ABLE 2626 is a, is a moderately massive galaxy cluster, which is located in the southern part of the Perseus Pegasus filament. The primary motivation of observing this galaxy cluster was because it has uh, many interesting jellyfish candidate galaxies. But after our h on observations, of course, we found many other interesting uh, galaxies. Uh, so we had a single near cat pointing uh, uh, pointed to the cluster core, and we have imaged the sky area of two by two degree. Here uh, on the left, we see the diverse optical morphologies of the galaxies that are imaged in H1. Uh, we can see they cover a wide range of morphology from the spiral bar to the very low surface brightness galaxies. Uh, on the right, we are having a VR walk through the imaged cosmic volume. The, the H1 column density sensitivity we have is to, two times 10 to the 19 per centimeter square, uh, which is pretty amazing. And we have used Caracol pipeline to reduce the source uh, data and Sophia source finding software to find the sources in our queue. And we have detected 219 uh, sources uh, uh, from this single mirror that point. And uh, so, uh, now, I would like to talk about the distribution of uh, different over densities in our surveyed volume. So here we, uh, we see mostly three over densities. The green over density is the cluster able to 626 itself. And the orange over density is uh, a collection of groups, which we call the swarm. And the magenta over density is a background uh, cluster able to 637. So though uh, we see that in terms of redshift, the H1 and the optical redshifts mostly follow each other. But if we see at the sky distribution, they look a bit different. In particular, if we look at these three over densities, we see that there are not many H1 detections corresponding to the optical redshifts, uh, which is understandable from the previous studies that close to the centers of the clusters or over densities, there are always fewer H1 detections. And then Healy Wilner et al. has found the substructures in the different over densities that we have uh, in the, uh, the Meerkat survey. And in particular, they have found six different substructures in ABLE 2626. And here is example of uh, H1 data products that we have for all the galaxies uh, that we have detected in our survey. Uh, here is the Deco's color image. Uh, here we are looking at the H1 map on the optical where uh, the outermost contour is coming from three times signal to noise from this uh, signal to noise map. And uh, we have this information for 219 galaxies in total. Uh, here is the link where you can uh, look at atlas pages of all the galaxies in our survey. And so the take home from this part is Meerkat is really a game changer in radio astronomy with its sensitivity and field of view. And we have 219 DDAC H1 detections with a single Meerkat pointing in and around able to 626. Now I'd like to go to the detail of the H1 morphologies of the galaxies that we have detected in and around able to 626. So we want to understand how to quantify the environmental effects on the H1 disks. And to do that, at first we have to define, uh, we have to quantify the H1 morphologies of the outer H1 disks. And we have used three different definitions to do that. The first one is the visual classification method. We have, uh, uh, we have divided our sample in three different classes. One is the satellite H1 sources, which have regular H1 disks. Uh, the second one is the disturbed H1 sources, which have one-sided asymmetry or excess of H1 flux in one direction. And there are unsettled sources, which have three-dimensional asymmetry. Then we also measured how offset is H1 from the optical by actually uh, kind of measuring the projected distance from the H1 and the optical center. And then we also calculated modified asymmetry parameter, uh, which was first introduced by Lely et al. And uh, it actually ensures equal contribution from all the pixels uh, in the asymmetry index and to measure the contribution from the outer parts of the H1 disks also. Because in the traditional definition of asymmetry parameter, uh, high, higher weightage is given to the brightest pixels, uh, but the, mostly the brightest pixels are always towards the center of a galaxy. But for H1 morphologies, uh, uh, to understand the environmental effects, we have to uh, measure asymmetry in the outer uh, H1 disk. So AMOD makes sure that uh, the equal contribution is also given to the outer part of the H1 disk. 
And we also have three different galaxy populations uh, uh, for which we have significant H1 detections. As I mentioned before, in ABLE 2626, there are two different environments. One is the galaxies that are not in the substructure, uh, but in the cluster. So they are purely uh, in the cluster environment. We call them isolated galaxies. And then the other class is the galaxies which are in the substructures in ABLE 2626. So they have group environment, which is influenced by the cluster environment. And then there is the other uh, over density, which is the swarm, which is a purely a group environment with, without any ICM interaction. And the questions we'd like to address is, is pre-processing at play in the groups in ABLE 2626 or in the swarm? And how do they compare with the isolated galaxies in ABLE 2626? And for that, we have used H1 deficiency as an important parameter to understand the difference of the environmental effects uh, in the different galaxies. And we have made several versions of this plot, H1 deficiency versus projected distance. Here uh, in the different colors, uh, we are seeing uh, isolated galaxies in light green and substructure galaxies in dark green. And uh, in orange, we are seeing the galaxies in the swarm. And we have calculated H1 deficiency as a difference uh, between the expected H1 mass and the observed H1 mass. And the expected H1 mass is calculated from the scaling relation from the Nesetol. And what we can clearly see here is close to the center of ABLE 2626, there are more H1 deficient galaxies, which are also seen in literature. That is the most clear uh, correlation that we can see here. Moreover, if we look at the galaxies outside R200, we see that both the isolated, the substructure galaxies and the swarm galaxies, they have similar range of H1 deficiencies. And inside R200, if we focus on the most H1 deficient galaxies, they seem to be mostly isolated galaxies. So does it mean that the group environment in ABLE 2626 is uh, providing some kind of protection against the cluster environment? Uh, and uh, uh, protection against the gas removal mechanisms in ABLE 2626, and what mechanisms are actually causing the H1 deficiencies in all these over densities? And uh, do these mechanisms act as pre processing in uh, the substructures and in the swarm? Uh, by the way, these dashed lines actually uh, signify the range of uh, H1 deficiency for field galaxies. And then we focused on the most H1 deficient galaxies. And uh, here we are looking at the H H1 contours. So we can see all of them have like either truncated or like offset or uh, small H1 disks and they have yellowish optical disks. So that means that they're already in the advanced stage of uh, gas depletion mechanisms. And if we focus on the most H1 rich galaxies, we see that they have really extended H1 disks and they're blue in optical. So that means they're like still actively start forming from their huge H1 gas reserve. And then we made the same plot, but now use different symbols for different visual classifications because we are interested to understand if somehow this H1 deficiency has some correlation with the H1 morphologies of these galaxies. So to remind ourselves, V class one galaxies are uh, settled galaxies, V class two galaxies are disturbed one-sided asymmetry galaxies and V class three galaxies are unsettled galaxies. So what we can see here is these V class three galaxies, the galaxies with star markers, they're within the range of uh, H1 deficiency for field galaxies. So that means these unsettled galaxies are uh, actually in active stage of stripping. That's why they're still not completely depleted of their H1 gas that makes them moderately H1 deficient. And if we focus on the disturbed galaxies, they're mostly in the substructures rather than the isolated galaxies. So that means probably in the substructures of uh, this cluster, there are more tidal interactions happening, of course, because there are more nearest neighbors and that is causing these galaxies to be more disturbed than the isolated galaxies. And if we focus on the most H1 deficient galaxies, that is the galaxies above these dashed lines, then we see that most of the, those galaxies, like 12 out of 17 galaxies, have disturbed H1 disks. So probably they're still under influence of uh, cluster environmental processes like Rampusha stripping. And five out of the 17 galaxies have small but settled H1 disk. So that means probably these galaxies are under uh, the effect of Rampusha stripping for quite a while 
so that's why the h1 gas is like mostly depleted making them like small but settle h1 based or the processes like harassment or starvation or thermal evaporation is at play in, in those galaxies that also causes small H1 disk rather than asymmetric H1 disk. And then we made the same plot, but then now color coded with H1 offset. And uh, uh, the field and the open circles are for isolated and the substructure galaxies in AB2626. So we uh, do not see any correlation with H1 offset, meaning that H1 deficient galaxies are not necessarily H1 offset. That is understandable because all the different environmental mechanisms not necessarily cause offset H1 disks, as I mentioned before. And also, uh, all the galaxies are not in the uh, perpendicular to the line of sight. So even if ram stripping is at play, uh, it might not be uh, very um, visible in this uh, plot. And uh, then uh, we have also uh, made the same plot, but color coded with uh, AMOD. We have fewer galaxies here because only for fewer galaxies, we have high signal to noise and uh, uh, only few galaxies are dissolved. Uh, but we do not see any correlation here as well. However, we see that the most H1 deficient galaxy is also most uh, having high AMOD value, meaning it is also very asymmetric. And next, uh, we wanted to also understand if star formation rate has any correlation with H1 deficiency. For uh, to understand that, we made the very simple plot of star forming main sequence and tried to understand where these galaxies lie compared to that. And we have used uh, star formation main sequence uh, from Plover et al. because they have also used WISE data and they have used uh, same calibrations. Uh, for calculating stellar masses and star formation rate uh, as our data. And uh, um, here is uh, the star forming main sequence and here is the quenching threshold from Kluver et al. And uh, what we can uh, clearly see here is both the uh, cluster galaxies and the swarm galaxies have actually a slightly lower star formation rate than the usual for the normal galaxies. And then if we focus on the outlier galaxies, for example, the most H1 deficient galaxies in the swarm, we see that most, like all of them have nearest neighbor or the offset H1 disks, meaning that their H1 deficiency is mostly caused by the tidal interactions uh, with the nearest neighbors. While if we focus on the cluster galaxies, uh, we see like the, uh, this quenched galaxy 150, it has a fairly uh, regular H1 disk, but probably the H1 column density is too low to form stars. And this galaxy 65, which is also very H1 deficient, but uh, the H1 disk is uh, very small rather than asymmetric. Uh, so the take home from this section is asymmetric offset or smaller H1 disks are not necessarily the result of cluster environment, uh, the, uh, as we have seen in the previous studies, but uh, we can also see them in uh, like uh, the group environment. So probably it is imprinted by pre-processing. And the substructure galaxies in the cluster are uh, more asymmetric than the isolated non-substructure galaxies, uh, meaning that in substructures there are more tidal interactions happening that makes them more asymmetric. And in both and cl uh, cluster and group environment, uh, the star formation rate actually is uh, reduced than the usual star formation rate for normal galaxies, meaning also in the group environment and the substructure environment, there might be some pre-processing that is happening before these galaxies fall into the cluster. And then I'd like to focus on uh, Miyaker observations of some jellyfish candidate galaxies uh, in this cluster. So these jellyfish candidate galaxies were identified from the optical B and V band images. And uh, four of them are J class one galaxies, meaning their least probable jellyfish galaxies from their optical, uh, uh, from the optical point of view. And two of the galaxies, JW100 and JW103, are most uh, more probable jellyfish galaxies, higher class jellyfish galaxies from the optical point of view. And here are the H1 atlas pages for all these six galaxies. Uh, we do not have to go into the detail of the H1 properties of these galaxies. But what we can clearly see here is the most probable, uh, the higher class jellyfish galaxies have lower H1 masses compared to the other jellyfish candidate galaxies. But uh, this is quite telling. That actually means that the optically identified jellyfish candidate galaxies are already in the advanced stage of Rampusha stripping, 
if we look at the, their H1 content. And uh, looking at the H1 morphologies of the other four jellyfish candidate galaxies, we do not see any obvious sign of rampage stripping. That is like any one-sided feature. The, and they are pretty H1 rich, so we call them non-jellyfish galaxies thereafter. And then we are interested in understanding the H1 mass, uh, how the H1 mass of these uh, higher class jellyfish galaxies, the jellyfish galaxies, uh, compare uh, with the H1 mass of the uh, other cluster galaxies or the field galaxies or these uh, uh, non-jellyfish galaxies. So we made a H1 mass versus stellar mass plot. And here uh, in blue, we see the alpha alpha stacking results uh, for field galaxies. And in different circles, we are seeing uh, the cluster galaxies from different environments, including the A2626 uh, galaxies also in green. And in pentagons, we are seeing those non-jellyfish, uh, jellyfish candidate galaxies. And in stars, we are seeing the jellyfish galaxies. We have extra stars here from the JVLA H1 observations. So what we can clearly see here is all these jellyfish galaxies and stars, they have lower H1 masses for their stellar masses. If we compare with the more, mostly field galaxies and most of the cluster galaxies. And then we're interested in understanding the star formation rate of these galaxies, how, how do they compare with uh, the reference sample galaxies. And uh, we made the same star formation main sequence plot from Kluver. And uh, what we see here is these jellyfish galaxies and stars, they're not really outliers in this plot. And then we combine these two plots and we have additional reference sample here uh, from XCAS. And here we are plotting star formation rate versus H1 mass. And here we see that these eight uh, jellyfish galaxies are really standing out. All these five jellyfish galaxies are actually um, having higher star formation rate for the H1 masses. So that is uh, that means that though these galaxies are H1 strip, they're very H1 deficient, but the little H1 they have is actually efficiently getting transformed into stars and they are not yet quenched. And then I uh, focused on one particular jellyfish galaxy, JW100, because for this galaxy, we have ancillary data from ALMA observations and news IFU observations. And I was interested to understand the multi-phase ISM of this galaxy. And here uh, we are looking at the different velocity channels uh, of this galaxy and in different colors, we are seeing different ISM phases. So what we can see here is um, in the different velocity channels, the different phases are stripped at different efficiencies. And then uh, we were interested to understand the diff uh, effect of uh, H1, uh, different H1 depletion channels. And uh, so there are three main H1 depletion channels. The first obvious one is of course, the pressure stripping of the H1 gas. Uh, so we have found that at least 70% of H1 gas is removed from the disk of this galaxy. And then the second one is uh, in situ uh, H2 formation from the H1 formation in the tail of this galaxy. And uh, to calculate that, we have already um, uh, ALMA uh, C observations. So from that, we have calculated that uh, at least uh, estimated that at least 10% of the H1 gas is being converted to the clumpy H2. And then some of the H1 gas will also be ionized uh, by the young star formation. And uh, this H1 to H alpha conversion fraction is uh, negligible compared to the other two. So that means that at least like 10% of H1, uh, sorry, 80% of the H1 gas is already stripped out of this galaxy. So JW1 uh, sorry. Is... sorry to interrupt one minute. Okay, sure. So uh, this galaxy is already at a very advanced stage of ram pressure stripping. So the take home from this section is optically identified jellyfish galaxies are already in the advanced stage of ram pressure stripping uh, in terms of H1. And jellyfish galaxies generally have higher star formation rate for their H1 masses. And then I'd like to talk about the future project uh, that I asked to conduct during uh, my postdoc, uh, which I call Prova. Prova is a Sanskrit word that means light. And uh, Prova is also name of a goddess of power and strength. Uh, it stands for pre-processed and backsplash galaxies in multi-phase hydrogen aspect. So we have expanded our single meerkat pointing to four meerkat uh, extra pointings that actually uh, looks at the outskirts of able 2626 
to investigate the infalling galaxies, which might be pre-processed or the backsplash collection galaxies. And then we also have uh, ALMA and SMA observations of uh, uh, CO content of the star forming galaxies uh, in this area. And we have H alpha the INT imaging that will provide information about the ionized gas. So the idea is to get information about all these three different ISM phases and to understand uh, in detail the physical mechanisms uh, that are happening also in the outskirts of this cluster. And I'd like to finish my talk here with a summary. And thanks a lot for your patience to listen to my work and my good questions. Thank you very much. This was very interesting. I'm also a big fan of gas. So, okay. is there any questions from our participants in Zoom? I don't see any raised hands yet. Let me just quickly check the YouTube channel. No, I can ask until someone. Actually, oh, okay, we have Avinash. Hi, hi, Tirna. Uh, very nice talk and a lot of work you have done. I just have one question about the cluster Abel 2626. You mentioned about the isolated galaxies and galaxies in the SOM. So, how did you select it, isolated, and the galaxies in the SOM? Yes, so I mean, isolated galaxies means they're not really isolated, that means they uh, are not part of a big substructure. I think in, uh, in this plot, you can see that, um, so we had MMT uh, uh, survey to collect additional redshifts for a lot of like almost 2,300 galaxies in our survey region. And from that we have, uh, uh, Hilly Wilner has done DS test to identify the substructures in these different over densities. And from that, uh, we understood like uh, able to 626 has six, six different substructures. And uh, so hereby I am, defining the galaxies as isolated if they're not, not part of these substructures. So they're not really isolated galaxies. And of course, from the red shifts, uh, uh, as I mentioned here, we understood that like these are part of table 2626 and these are part of the swarm. And then we also identify the substructures in the swarm. So these are mainly done from the optical red shifts, from the literature and from our MMP survey. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from participants? Okay, so I, I want to ask some of, oh, Avinash, do you have another question or did you just forget to lower your hand? Yeah, okay. Uh, may I ask, uh, so as you get closer to the BCG, how well does the visual classification stand? How well can you differentiate the HI content between the galaxies? Like, does it get mixed up with the titles, like we, can you differentiate between RPS or types of streaming very well? So actually this, um, I mean, the jellyfish galaxies uh, that are extreme examples of ground pressure stripping that has dramatic tails, they are mostly located very close to the BCD. And uh, because like they're very close to the cluster center, so they have the stronger effect of the IC, uh, ICM and that's how they are actually very easily uh, stripped. and so you can see here that, um, I don't know if you can see. So this is the plaster BCG, uh, like able to six to six is a, uh, actually a radio continuum image. And the, the galaxy JW100 about which I talked about, which is the jellyfish galaxy, which is right next to it. So, and you can see a very nice radio continuum tail also for this galaxy. So actually these jellyfish galaxies are very close to the cluster center. And uh, since we have H1 observations, uh, it's not, it's uh, different from radio continuum observations. So in that sense, it's fairly um, unaffected by, by the BCG. If the BCG has your H1 emission, then um, that is a different story. Okay, thank you very much. This is great data as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, let me quickly check. We don't have any questions in the YouTube channel. Well, in that case, I can hand back to Jacob for the closing. Yes, thank you very much. Good, cool. Thank you, Tima, Tima, and, and thank you, Casper, again for the great talk. And congratulations to both for your new positions and for your future uh, career. And thank you and congratulations for participating. And I would like to thank all the participants, Tutku, of course, for, for the great help and, and 
for chatting uh, the session. And I guess see you all. Uh, be, be reminded to everyone that the CVs of our speakers are in fact available on you on, on our program page, so you can go and download the CVs and so to meet them closer. So thank you everyone very much again. Congratulations, and see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh.